the introduction. I'll echo what was said before. It's a great pleasure, a real honor to be here at this conference for the first time. It's great to be in Croatia, Alkatia. Special thanks to everyone who, to the organizing committee for inviting me here. And also a special thanks to Igor, who's been the best host ever, so thank you for your hospitality. Hopefully this presentation follows on um, nicely from the, from the previous one. And I think it's probably a good time now, we're talking about 40 years in kinesiology, to not only to look back, but to look forward on maybe some areas that we, we need to consider in the sports sciences. But first, the first question is, is there actually a future, I think? We've had the cyclones, we've had the earthquakes, we've got people who are actually predicting the end of the world. This mass suicide refers to the Mayan calendar, which predicts the end of time to occur on the 21st of December of this year. So it's a little bit of a video just to wake you up, but also there's actually a serious message in there as well. And I think we'll talk about it in some of the slides, but for many thousands of years, people have been predicting the end of the world. At the moment, apparently, the Maya calendar predicts the world will end next year. I hope not. I'd like to come back to Croatia for this conference. But this highlights the danger in predicting the future. So I'll put up some ideas on maybe the future of sports science, but it's difficult and many people before me have got it wrong and there's a good chance I'll get a lot of it wrong as well. I really like this quote. This is from 1899 and this is the head of the US Office of Patents who said, everything that can be invented has been invented. Wrong. This one as well, from 1977. There is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. Now we all have a computer in our pocket. We've all got iPhones, Blackberries, etc. Who knows what the, what the future is going to bring. And so there, again, the other thing with the future is that it was probably easier in the past, but the future is arriving more quickly than ever before. If we sit here and think about 30, 40, 50 years time, that's probably what's going to happen in 5 or 10 years time. I mean, all of us in the room, I can, I was a teenager when I had one of the first personal computers, a little Apple IIc I remember. In that, in that time, things have changed so rapidly, they're going to continue to change. And we've talked about the evolving field of sports science. We need to try and be ready for it. The basis for my talk, in 2010, this is a government research body in Australia, and they went through and they looked at, we've got a bunch of scientists together and input from lots of people, and trying to identify from what they called lots of trends, are, there's hundreds and thousands of trends around the world, and they tried to identify five mega trends. I'll go through these and I'll also add one of my own. So the first they identified was more from less. The second was a personal touch, divergent demographics, people being on the move, and an eye world. So everything in the natural world will have a digital component. They applied this to just science in general, but I'd like to in the next few minutes also show how, how I think it's also relevant to sports science and some of the things that we need to think about. So the first one is more from less. And I think especially in, uh, yeah, in a country like Croatia, four and, a half million, four and a half million people, how can you compete with countries like America with 350 million people, China with a billion people, India, countries like that with a billion people? 
you need to get the absolute maximum out of the small, you know, out of your small population. So I think this was again from 1950, where some of the first talent ID was done in Australia using this massive rome ergometer. So I think increasingly, what's going to happen is nations, especially like Croatia, but also Australia, with only 20 million people, they need to identify the best athletes, and they need to get the best out of them and they need to get them in the best sports. And this is, you know, around the, around the world, we have an aging population. There's also problems of decreases in fertility. So I think increasingly, especially for smaller countries, but other countries, we're going to have to get more from less and develop better and better talent ID um, structures. And this probably also has um, implications for the military. We've got an aging population, We've got a less active population, so even if we want to apply some of our sports science to the military, I think more from less, identifying the, the best talent and directing them to the best, um, best sport for their abilities is going to become very important. I think we're going to see a personal touch becoming an uh, increasing focus <coughs> of sports science. And what I mean by that is understanding and supplying the in intimate needs of individual athletes. One of the things that, I guess not just particular to sports science, but to any science, is we tend to study means. So we look at differences in means between groups. We look at regression lines, we try and predict things. And quite often we get a little bit upset if in our research we see an outlier. But this is our elite athlete. Elite athletes, apologies to any elite athletes in the room, but you know, they're freaks. They're not the same as everyone else. And sometimes by looking at the average, we may be missing important messages. So not only with that respect, but I think what we're going to be finding, and this is a, it's um, a little bit of a, maybe a silly example, but this is a, uh, a running shoe where you can go online and you can choose what colour you want, what type of sole you want, what type of laces. So it's a very simplistic um, image. But to illustrate the point, quite often we see in our sports science, maybe especially in team sports, we try and train the whole team. We do the same training at the same time. And not just team sports, other sports we train people as a group. More and more, I think, in sports science, we're going to be looking at not how to train, train a group of athletes, but how to train one particular athlete. What is the best type of training? What is the best type of nutrition? What is the best type of biomechanical change for each individual athlete to get the maximum performance out of that athlete? We're also going to see, and it's already arriving, more genome-wide association studies. So what do I mean by that? I think a few other speakers have already touched on it, is the use of genes to try and identify specific athletes. As I said, we're already doing that. In America, you can pay, I think, $500 to do an Actin gene, Actin 3 gene test to tell you if your little eight-year-old boy is going to be a, an elite athlete when he grows up. So that's just starting now and it's not too far away. There's also some of the biggest medical um, firms in the world are predicting that you'll be able to do a gene test and it'll be able to tell you in 10, 20, 30 years which diseases are you most likely to get and what should you start to do today to try and prevent those diseases. So genes, and as mentioned before, genes are going to play an increasingly bigger role in our normal lives but also the roles of athletes. I think in the few, as I said, that's already been done. The, we're already doing that, the correlation between genes and performance. But the future is going to be, can we use that information to also individually design training programs or nutrition? Maybe with our elite athletes, we'll be able to do a gene test and say, okay, you should do this type of training. You should take this particular nutrition product to achieve your best. And increasingly, we'll be doing research to try and understand why it is that those, these particular alterations in our genes affect our performance and our adaptations to training. 
This is what I was saying before. So this is IBM. In 2009, they said that in the next five years, your doctor will provide you with a genetic map that tells you what health risks you might face in your lifetime and specific things that you can do to prevent them based on your specific DNA, all for less than $100. So this is going to happen in medicine, and I'm, I'm convinced that it's also going to happen in sports science. And so we need to be on top of that, not just wait for it to arrive, because obviously with that also comes the, the um, possibility for abuse. And we may be start, and we're already seeing people starting to look at gene doping, for example. It was nicely mentioned before, there's a lot of ethical concerns about this. With all this technology, where is talent ID going to start and finish? Are we going to be able to tell from our scan some athletes? This guy here looks like he's got a nice defence, maybe he can take on Roddick as a defender in basketball. But this technology may, I think, is not too far away and we need to be prepared for it. Associated with that is when are we going to start to train our young, our young children? You know, we talk, lots of people talk about overseas, you know, gymnasts who start at three, four, five years of age. When do we need to start training to produce elite athletes? And what are the ethical implications if we start to, if we start, to start this young to um, train our athletes? You're also going to see, and we've talked about before, the merging interdisciplinary nature of different fields. And I think we're going to see the emergence, it's already happening, of functional foods. So rather than going to the pharmacy and maybe getting you know, a protein powder or some amino acid, this is going to be integrated into our food. So we can go and grab an apple to improve protein synthesis. We'll be able to grab some fruit to improve our recovery. So things are going to get interesting. I also put this one in here. So the third big trend that was predicted by the Australian Research Agency is divergent demographics. And I've got this example. I think this really is a nice example of the multidisciplinary field of kinesiology. I'm not sure about the situation in, um, in Croatia, Croatia, but I imagine it's like other places in the world like Australia. But children are doing less and less physical activity. So you can see here that Australian children spend on average three to four hours a day in front of a screen. Almost a quarter of Australian children are obese and overweight, and a lot of Australian children aren't eating the, the right nutrition. So maybe as a sports scientist, as someone who works with athletes, maybe I'm thinking, okay, that's not very interesting, that's physical activity, that's children, someone else can worry about that. But if we don't worry about this, where are our elite athletes going to come from? If all our children are overweight, they're not eating a healthy diet, then we don't have a, we've got no chance of um, getting elite athletes. So this is a concern from a society point of view, but it's also a concern for sports science. I put this in here, and I don't really have too much to say on it, but you know, the fact that we're here, the world is moving rapidly, and, and athletes are moving around, there's jet lag, coaches are changing countries, etc., etc. So I think you know, this increasing mobile world is going to also have an impact on sports science, less so than the other, the other areas. So. And I think the eye world. So everything in the natural world will have a digital component, and that's already happening. So we're seeing the digitization of our athletes, we're seeing sensors in balls, we're seeing stadiums that have motion analysis systems that can track athletes, etc., etc. We need to be prepared for this, A, because it's changing so rapidly, but B, what do we do with all this data that all these systems are giving us? You know, we already have an information overload, but all the information that's coming from all these sensors that are in, in boots, in fabrics, in, in balls, in stadiums, we need to find a way to be able to handle all this data. And this is the one that I've added, which wasn't wasn't in the, um, the previous one, but we know that in the world, you know, there's always um, stories about it, but people seem to be getting less and less sleep. 
and we know that sleep is very important for yeah, just basic things for our daily lives and, and enjoyment, etc. But I think we're going to increasingly find this encroaching on kinesiology. So how, what is the effect of kinesiology on sleep? Can we use exercise to improve sleep patterns? There's also evidence that sleep is important for recovery. So when we do exercise, if we're not getting enough sleep, are we going to be able to recover appropriately, regenerate the muscle, get the adaptations that we need? And it's not just from a physiological point of view. There's a lot of good evidence emerging now that sleep is very important when we learn things. So if we have an athlete out on the field and we're teaching them how to do a new, a new move, a new drill in soccer, if they don't get enough sleep, they're not going to be able to learn that task to the best of their ability. So I think, and there's also, there's already emerging, I was just in Brazil, there's a, a sleep clinic that's looking at exercise and sleep, and I think this is going to be a, a very big topic in the next, um, in the next few years. There's also the, the Australian Institute of Sport, they have a recovery centre, which traditionally looked at water recovery, things like that, is now working with sleep physiologists to try and also have a look at the effects of sleep on elite athlete performance. So that's a few comments on what um, should be may happen in the in the future. What I'd like to do now, if I may, is just make a few comments on the present and maybe identify some areas in kinesiology where I think we can make some make some improvements. The first is that. And I've, I've done all this, but sometimes I think in our field we do too much descriptive research. And the reason for that is sometimes just because we have access to the data. So maybe we're working with a team and, and we're able to, to, to measure something. And I, I see this a lot with, um, with team sports in particular. And again, not to, to criticise any research, but I've done this particular, I've done this research as well, and so I'm criticising myself. But you know, 30 or 40 years ago you had Tom Riley who did some motion analysis of soccer using video cameras and just notation and he found out that the soccer players ran 10 to 12 kilometres in a game. Then we had automated technologies and we found out that soccer players run 10 to 12 kilometres per, year, uh, per game and now we've got GPS systems where we can put them on players' backs and we can very accurately monitor how much they run in a game and we're finding that they can run 10 to 12 kilometres in a game. So, as I said, and then sometimes we'll do this in different countries and we find out that Croatian players run 10 to 12 kilometres and English players run 10 to 12 kilometres. Obviously, some of that information is important, but I think maybe sometimes we do too much of it. And I guess it, it then comes down to the purpose. If our purpose is to help athletes in their performance, then we, I think sometimes we need to move on. And I think this is a, a good example of sometimes where descriptive research is not ideal. This paper was published so six, seven years ago in Nature. And these authors looked at the linear extrapolation of current sprint data, indicates that women will run the same time for the 100 metre in the 2,156 Olympics. And there was a lot of feedback about that. One of the things that I then went and did was I looked at the women's pole vault, pole vault record. And what you can see, there's a nice linear extrapolation between pole vault height and year. Try some. I then thought, okay, looking on the sprint data, what do you think that the women will be jumping at the 2,156 Olympics, if we base on a linear extrapolation. Any guesses? Around about 15 metres. It's, as I said, it's difficult to predict the future, but I think that's a very unlikely that, that women are going to be jumping 15 metres in the pole vault. So, we need to be careful with some of this descriptive research. I also 
sometimes I, I'm concerned sometimes that some of the sports science research, there's too much emphasis on the placebo effect. And I see that at, sometimes when I actually work with coaches, they're probably not that interested in whether a supplement or something works. What they're interested in is whether the, coach, whether the athlete thinks that it works. And maybe that's a good psychological strategy, but I worry from, as a sports scientist, that if we continue to supply this placebo effect, that we'll lose credibility. I think I'll give you a, a nice example. There's some problems with this study. They didn't have a, for example, a, a control group. But what they did is they got a bunch of strength trained guys to do strength training for seven weeks. And what they sit, said was the subjects who have the biggest strength gains in those seven weeks, we will give you some anabolic steroids after that to continue your training. So they gave Dianabol, or they said they were going to give Dianabol after that. They then selected the eight, the, the people who had the eight, the eight, the people had the the eight people had the best gains in strength. They then told them that they were going to give them an anabolic steroid, but they didn't, and got them to train for four weeks. And here you can see the power of the placebo effect. In four weeks, the athletes who thought they were getting a, a drug had almost twice the increase in strength than the group that just did normal training. So it's a cautionary tale. I think for a lot of our sports science research, and sometimes in an effort to be applied, we sometimes forget about the placebo effect. And we need to be much better, especially with supplement studies, but also training studies. Sometimes we have people come in training in our laboratories, and maybe the fact that they're in the scientific laboratory, there's people with lab coats around. Maybe we're seeing different things than what we see out in the field. So we need to take better care of these effects. And without being too controversial, I think sometimes we need to be a little bit careful about the role of the coach. I mean, it's very important that the coach is involved in the scientific process, but we need to be careful that they're not the people who are driving the research project. And I'll show you some ideas in a minute, but I think it's important because sometimes we need that new ideas will not germinate if we only focus what we think is important at the moment. And quite often, and it's quite understandable, because that's the field that the coach works in the moment. You know, they may not have a job next year, so they're not interested in five or ten years' time. But as scientists, we need to be able to do both, to give some immediate answers to the coach, something that's going to help their players next week, at the championships, but we also need to be working in the background on ideas that are going to make a difference in 5, 10, 15, 20 years time. So I'll finish with just a, a few ideas about the future and maybe some areas where I, I think there's real opportunity to, to do some really interesting sports science research. I'd like to start just with this quote and I think it's not just sports science, in every field we see this battle, war, between the mechanistic research and the applied research. And it shouldn't be a war because it's not one or the other. We need both. We need very applied research, but we also need some mechanistic studies. And I'm sure you can read this. It's really interesting. This was, you know, Socrates, so more than 1,500 1, years ago. And what he says here, you amuse me with your obvious fear that the public will disapprove if the subjects you prescribe don't seem useful. And sometimes we have that problem in sports science where if we can't see an immediate application, yeah, it's difficult to get support for that research. But sometimes I think it's going to be that some of that research which doesn't appear useful today is going to make some of the biggest differences in performance. And we need to find a way to support the very applied research, but also the mechanistic research. And I'll give, you, I'll give you some examples. This might surprise you, but Einstein was probably the, 
probably the world's first sports scientist. Obviously, he's come up with his very famous equation, which is E equals MC squared. And that was just a theory. It was difficult for people to test. So to test that, they came up with atomic clocks. So these atomic clocks, so they could put in space, they could measure very minute changes in time. These atomic clocks is what has now led to GPS systems. So the GPS that you have in your car, that you have in your iPhone, the GPS systems that athletes wear on their backs came because scientists wanted to test this useless equation that, that Einstein came up with 50 years ago. So I'm not saying that sports scientists need to be going and making up equations like this, but we need to keep in mind that sometimes doing very basic research is going to lead to very, very applied, practical findings later on. And probably in the world of team sports, you can't get anything more practical than a GPS that can be worn on an athlete's back so that we can measure distances, speed, acceleration, changes of direction during a match. This is one of my, one of my favourite examples, is the invention of the clapscape. Okay, so that came from, from the Netherlands, a guy called um, Gerrit Benning and Chanel, who's no longer with us. But the clapscape came from pure biomechanics. And this researcher, professor in biomechanics, wanted to work it, thought the problem with skating is that there's a limited time when you're actually able to exert force onto the ice and propel yourself forward. So thinking biomechanically, he thought, what can I do? So what he did is he put a hinge on the skate. So what that meant is that when the ice skater is pushing off, they're able to maintain contact with the ice for longer, so exert force for the ice for longer, and to be able to skate faster. Where this becomes really interesting is that none of the athletes, none of the coaches were interested in the clap skates. The clap skates were in invented probably 50 15, maybe 20 years before any athletes would go near it. They were able to maybe get some junior athletes to try it. And a friend of mine is uh, Joss um, De Koning, who was a PhD student with this researcher, so he's told me some of the story. And maybe it's part myth, but what actually happened is before, before a, um, a big race in um, Holland, they managed to convince one of the best athletes in the Netherlands to just try it during warm-up to see, what it, see if he liked it. So he was skating and he was enjoying it a little bit and he got a little bit lost in time. Then it was time for his race and he didn't have time to change out of his clap skate and get into his regular skate. He then did the race and did one of his best, probably did his personal best and since then, you know, well since then what happened was we had the Lillehammer Olympics, where the Netherlands was the only country with clap skates. They won every single gold medal in speed skating, and they won every single medal with a world record time. And since then, there's not an athlete who doesn't use the clap skate for their performance. So as I said, good science, great idea, but 15 or 20 years to try and convince athletes and coaches to adopt that technology. I should point out that this is not particular to sports science. It happens in almost every scientific field. And this is an interesting study where they looked at original medical research and said that it takes 10 to 20 years before that is adopted into routine medical practice. So if it takes 10 to 20 years to adopt something that's going to save somebody's life, you can imagine it's going to be, you know, 20 years is probably not too bad to adopt some sports science technology. It's a little bit distressing though because it means that, this is me on a good day, if, if I do a really great scientific discovery now, that's what I'm going to look like before athletes start to use that scientific discovery to improve performance. And just to, to re-emphasise that point, another Interesting. I think another interesting point is that we have to accept 
that not all science is going to result in a useful outcome. And I think sometimes, you know, obviously we need to think about the practical applications, but the reality is that some science doesn't go anywhere. And again, another interesting study where they looked at pharmaceutical article, pharmaceutical research. They looked at 25,000 articles in the best journals. Only 2% had a claim of future applicability. Only 0.4% resulted in a clinical trial. And this number at the bottom is so small you can't see it, but 0.04% resulted in a useful drug within 30 years. So that represents about one article out of 25,000. So obviously we want our research to be applied and to change practice, but we also have to affect, uh, you know, accept that sometimes science doesn't result in practical applications. And just to make this point, there's a lot of talk about translational research, and it's absolutely essential. Our research has to make people help, help people to be healthier, to improve their performance. But translational, I think, in my opinion, doesn't have to mean immediate. Sometimes it can take 5, 10, 15 or 20 years before our good science becomes routine practice. You've been very patient and just the last few slides. Some ideas, again, where I think some interesting ideas for research, so what we call blue ocean research. As I said before, let's just take a while. Some of you may have already seen this, but we're going to increasingly see the involvement of genes in performance. In this study, the mouse at the back is a regular mouse, and the one at the front is a mouse that has one single gene that's missing. So that's a really striking example of you know, the role that genes are going to be playing in, in sports science. Just changing one single gene can make that much difference in performance. It's obvious that, that sports science will be going looking more at this into the future. Not only that, but we often see when we talk about elite athletes that they people say you need to choose your parents. Seems to be not only do you need to choose your parents, but you need to choose their lifestyle. In this study by an Australian group published last year, what they did is they changed the diets of the fathers, and just by changing the diet of the father, the children, so they gave a high-fat diet to the father, the children were born with an increased risk of diabetes and an increase in insulin resistance. So I think it's going to be interesting. We're going to see you know, sports science moving increasingly backwards or further to the beginning, you know, what can we do actually before children are born to make sure they're born healthy, to make sure maybe even give them up, we don't know. Is there anything that we can do before, you know, with the fathers or the mothers to increase the health and um, potentially even the performance of children? Technology is obviously going to play a very big role and I think you'll see it around the world Nearly all sports science departments will, will start to get involved more and more in technology. And just to finish with a few other examples, so you're seeing a lot of smart fabrics now. So these are fabrics, so it's a shirt. Instead of having sensors all over athletes, these are jerseys that can monitor muscular overload, changes in temperature, sweat, maybe tell you what, what type of rehydration drink you need to take after a different match, a different intensity, a different exercise, shirts that monitor fatigue, etc., etc. So 
we're going to increasingly see this, this technology in sports science. With different sensors, you know, once upon a time, and I guess we, we still do it, you know, we have the, the markers for biomechanics. This is increasingly being in, um, put inside stretchable wireless strain sensors. So instead of having markers and testing athletes in the, in the laboratory, it's probably not that far away that we'll be able to put some sort of fabric on an athlete and measure their kinematics, their kinetics, during an actual match, during a basketball match, during a soccer match, have a look at the changes in, in joint angles. There's even talk of sensors on the eyes, so we'll be able to put contact lenses on people and be able to, during a soccer match, record where were they looking when they did a pass, when they scored a goal, when the goal where, where was the goalkeeper looking, where was the, the guy taking a penalty. Again, we need to be ready for this. And just to, to finish with, I think this is a good quote from, the, from Arthur C. Clarke, the light, um, writer. If an elderly <coughs> but distinguished scientist says that something is possible, that's not me, elderly or distinguished, but we can leave the quote, he is almost certainly right. But if he says that it is impossible, he is very probably wrong. So I've tried to give you some examples, but there's going to be other things that you can think of that I haven't thought of. Which we, which we need to be prepared for. So with that, thank you very much for your attention tonight.